So if you misunderstood supply side economics, then I can see why you would end up with this caricatured uh, idea of trickle down economics. And uh, that would be the most generous interpretation that rather than a straw man, it is really a misunderstanding of supply side economics. Hello and welcome back to Nimitz Answers. Today's episode is a slightly unusual one, because in this episode we're going to talk about something that doesn't actually exist, but which nonetheless animates a lot of people, and that is trickle-down economics. The first question on that is, is trickle-down economics real? Okay, if this was an interview, I would now say, I'm glad you asked me that question, because the answer is no. Trickle-down economics is not a thing. It doesn't exist. There is no theory of economics, no school of economic thought called trickle-down economics. There are dozens of different schools of economic thought, some of them very eccentric, but trickle-down economics just isn't one of them. But nonetheless, what is trickle-down economics in the minds of those who use the term and believe that it is a real thing? Well, it seems to be the idea that uh, economic policy should prioritize making rich people even richer, giving lots of money to rich people uh, in the hope that it will somehow trickle down, uh, that rich people will do something with that money that benefits everybody. And this is sometimes illustrated in the form of a caricature, which shows a pyramid of wine glasses and somebody trying to fill up that pyramid starting at the top. So the pyramid, of course, uh, represents the income distribution and the wine represents the wealth of society or its economic output. Uh, and then somebody tries to fill up the pyramid starting at the top. The idea is that uh, eventually the wine uh, spills over or, or trickles down. Uh, except, uh, of course, this doesn't happen and there's different versions of this. In some versions, uh, the glass on top is simply so large that the wine never spills over. Or in a different one, it gets funneled, uh, it, uh, it leaks out and goes to a tax haven or something. Uh, but the idea is always that it doesn't work. Uh, but the trouble with that caricature is that this is an absolutely terrible metaphor for an economy. And no economist would think about economic life in such a way. The trouble with that caricature is that the wine bottle, which represents wealth, is just somehow there. It's just given. Comes out of nowhere, it's never explained where it comes from and it's really unimportant where it comes from. Uh, but of course, for an actual economist, that is the most important thing. An economist would start by asking, where does this wine bottle come from? Does the wine harvest grow over time or does it stagnate or does it fall? Does it differ between regions? Are there regions that are wine rich and regions that are wine poor? And if so, what, what do they do differently? What explains those differences in outcome? That's the kind of thing that an actual economist would ask. Where does wealth come from? How is it generated? Uh, what do rich places that generate lots of wealth do differently from poor places that don't generate a lot of wealth? That is economics. You don't start by assuming that wealth uh, is just somehow there and that the only question that matters is how you distribute it. And that in itself uh, already shows you that trickle-down economics cannot be a real thing. The second question is, is trickle-down economics good? Well, if it actually existed, if it were an actual economic theory, then no, it would be bad economics. Because the hypothetical trickle-down economist only seems to be concerned with making rich people richer, Whereas an actual economist, uh, certainly a free market economist such, such as myself, would be far more interested in how people get rich in the first place and what do people who get rich do uh, in order to get rich. So um, you could have an economy, let's take the example of uh, maybe uh, Pablo Escobar, the, the former Colombian drug baron. Um, he is someone who got massively rich through criminal activity. He was the richest man in Colombia for a while and one of the richest people in the world, I think. Now, if you have an economy where people like him rise to the top, then you have a problem. Ideally, you want people to get rich 
because they have fantastic uh, entrepreneurial ideas or they, uh, they have some rare talent that is very highly rewarded in the market. But if you have an economy where it is people who are engaged in criminal activity or in nepotism and cronyism who become rich, then you have a problem. And then, of course, uh, an economist wouldn't ask what can we do to uh, improve incentives for people like Pablo Escobar. Rather, an economist would ask, why is it someone like him who is the richest man in this country? Why is it not an entrepreneur? Why is it not uh, a skilled individual who has some, so, uh, some, some highly sought after skill? That's the kind of questions that actual economists ask. And uh, it's not about, it's, it doesn't really matter how rich the rich are. At least I'm not hugely interested in that. I'm interested in who the rich people are and what they did in order to become rich. In a society where the rich people are mostly entrepreneurs, uh, highly skilled people, risk takers, there it's not a problem uh, if some people get very rich. Um, even if l a, a, a lot of that is explained by luck or inheritance and things like that, even that isn't necessarily a problem. You have a problem when people get rich in the wrong way, by taking from others, by stealing from others, whether that's through cronyism uh, or outright criminality. In a society like that, in, in, in an economy like that, where the rich are mostly crooks, there you have a problem. The next question is, is trickle-down economics the same as supply side? Right, my most generous interpretation of trickle-down economics would be that it is a misunderstanding of supply-side economics. Supply-side economists are people who emphasize the role of incentives. They believe that wealth-creating activities are very easily discouraged and that economic policy should try to get out of the way, um, should try to tax or wealth creating activities lightly, regulate them lightly, try not to discourage them uh, because they believe that, uh, that people are very responsive to incentives and that therefore uh, wealth creation is very easily hindered. Now that can sometimes lead to policy recommendations or, or, or policy outcomes which benefit rich people more than poor people. It doesn't have to. You could also be in favor of tax cuts specifically for low-income earners uh, in order to improve work incentives for them. And that would also be supply-side economics. That's perfectly compatible with supply-side uh, supply economics. So the, the increase in the, the personal allowance of income tax in the Cameron years, that would be an example of that kind of supply-side economics. Uh, you could say the tax cuts in um, the Bill Clinton era that were aimed uh, specifically at low and, and middle income earners. That's a form of supply side economics. However, in the Reagan years and the early Thatcher years, there it was true that um, the kinds of reforms, uh, especially the, the tax cuts that were inspired by supply side economists, tended to be regressive. Uh, it was cuts in the top rate of income tax and in um, the taxation of, uh, of capital income. So therefore, supply-side economics can lend itself to the kind of tax and regulatory reforms that are regressive, benefit rich people more than poor people. And you can certainly criticize that. Uh, the opposite view within the economics profession would be some economists say that most people are not that responsive to taxation. So therefore, it doesn't really matter whether you tax the rich heavily or whether you tax them lightly. The rich will just do whatever they do. And if you cut taxes for them, they will just keep the difference and otherwise not change their behavior very much. That would be a legitimate critique of supply-side economics. But even then, supply-side economists are not trying to make the rich richer per se. That may be an outcome, but it's not their intention. What they're trying to do is uh, reduce disincentives against wealth creating activities. But it's not that they're trying to give money to the rich. The rich might end up richer than they were before, but only if 
and to the extent that they engage in wealth creating activities. Caricatured uh, idea of trickle down economics and uh, that would be the most generous interpretation that rather than a straw man it is really a misunderstanding of supply side economics but again even supply siders are not saying we should make the rich richer they are simply saying we should uh, not discourage wealth creating activities and if as a result of that some people uh, end up richer than they otherwise would supply side economists would be fine with that the third question is is trickle down economics Keynesian. Well, if at all, if it actually existed, if it were a real thing, then it would be a kind of reverse Keynesianism. Because Keynesians believe that, at least in a recession, the government should make sure that it's the poor who get more money, whether that's through higher benefits or, or in some other way, uh, because poor people have a higher propensity to spend their money, to consume, than rich people who have a higher savings ratio. And uh, therefore Keynesians would prioritize whatever makes uh, poor people richer, at least in a recession. Uh, whereas the hypothetical trickle-down economist does the opposite. They want rich people to become richer. So if at all, it's a kind of inverse Keynesianism. The next question is, is trickle-down economics real and Reddit? I'm guessing Reddit users will probably say that it is, but uh, it still isn't. Um, that doesn't make it so. It's not a thing and that doesn't depend on the forum on which you are debating it. Next question. Is trickle-down economics still used today? Well, if by that you mean cuts in top rates of taxation, um, the kind of supply-side economics that I talked about earlier, then that is something that was mostly confined to the 1980s when you had far higher top rates of income tax than today and also higher taxes on uh, higher rates of corporation tax and uh, more generally taxes through uh, on capital income. And that is when this logic of the, of the Laffer curve that uh, by cutting taxes you stimulate economic activity and generate more tax revenue in, in the longer term, uh, when, when this idea was more plausible. Nowadays, um, tax cuts may still stimulate economic activity, but for most taxes, not to such an extent that they become self-financing. So if you want to cut taxes, you also have to either uh, find tax revenue elsewhere or reduce spending accordingly. If you don't do that, then you have a problem because the low hanging fruits, the, the very easy tax cuts um, that were an option in the 1980s, they have already gone, at least for most types of taxes. And we saw that in the, in the recent mini budget, the Trust Quarteng budget, that was maybe the big mistake, one of the mistakes certainly that they made. Um, they promised lots of uh, unfunded tax cuts, which they wanted to finance through borrowing, additional borrowing, uh, deficit-funded tax cuts. They were hoping that this would lead to additional economic activity and um, probably that it would become self-funding in that way. It's just the market reaction showed us that most market participants didn't see it that way. And although, although Truss and Quateng did say uh, we will do some tax cuts, uh, some, some spending cuts further down the line, that wasn't seen as believable because, well, that's easy to say, but that is of course the politically tricky bit. That is the part where you have to find a, a political majority and it's just much easier to find majorities and political support for tax cuts than for spending cuts. And that's why that wasn't seen as believable. So this kind of easy, uh, supply side economics on at least on the tax side uh, that was uh, very much confined to the 1980s when the starting position was one of very high marginal tax rates. The next question is is trickle down economics neoliberalism? Uh, well it's you could say it's a, it's a caricature of, uh, of what liberalism is supposed to be or what free market economics is supposed to be and in that regard it has a lot of uh, it has a lot in common with the term neoliberal because that's also a term which, at least until a couple of years ago, was only ever used in a pejorative way. 
Until a few years ago, I didn't know a single person who would use neoliberal as a self-description. So when somebody talked about neoliberalism, you already knew that they were against it, whatever they meant by it, uh, they meant it in a negative way. Uh, that's only changed very recently and uh, in, in over the past four or five years or so, I have known some people who actually do use neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal uh, unironically as a self-description. And I think the motivation there is simply that they've given up, they've accepted that we will never get rid of this term. Uh, our opponents are going to use it no matter what, might as well try to own it. Um, and, but neoliberal, even though it was, uh, it's always been a, a polemical term and, and ridiculously overused, it was not entirely meaningless. Neoliberal used to mean, or, or still does mean, broadly somebody who supports a free market economy. It's usually used in, in that way, uh, whether pejoratively or not. It has some meaning, at least. Um, it's just that you would often see positions ascribed to a neoliberal that an actual believer in free market economics, such as myself, wouldn't recognize. Uh, an actual free market economist would, uh, would, would read uh, mainstream char characterizations of what neoliberals supposedly believe and would think, no, that's not at all what I believe. So it was often used for straw manning, but the term had some, some, some purpose, some justification. Uh, Trickle-down economics is even worse. Here it's not even a polemical overuse of something that's meaningful. It's just something that nobody actually believes and it's completely made up or as I said uh, in response to the supply side question, the most generous interpretation uh, that I could come up with would be that it is really a misunderstanding of what supply side economics is. Next question. Is trickle-down economics liberal or conservative? I'm guessing this is a question that comes from North America where liberal means left-wing, social democratic, progressive. Uh, it's a mischaracterization, a caricature of either conservatives and conservatism in the sense of uh, Thatcherism Reaganomics, uh, so meaning pro-market conservatives. It's either a mischaracterization of that or of liberalism in the old-fashioned European sense where liberal means classical liberal, uh, limited government, pro-market. It's a characterization of either of those. And the last question, is trickle-down economics still viable? Well, as I said before, trickle-down economics is not a thing and therefore it's very hard to judge the viability of something that is just made up. Um, trickle-down economics, unfortunately, is a straw man and therefore cannot be assessed in those terms. So thank you for watching and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Next time we will once again talk about something that actually does exist. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.